Good evening, class, all the way from Mississippi. Um, we travelled with the team today for our last two season games. Um, 14 hours on the bus. It's been a long day, but I wanted to take this time to... Um, I was able to do some reading and, and want to knock out the vlog. So, welcome to my hotel room. Here we are. It's nice and big. It's not bad at all. Um, so, diving in to try and stay within or close to my time. Um... This week, we had three very different um, articles. Um, I wanted to talk, firstly, I wanted to talk a little bit about the first article that we had, uh, the long, the longest one of the three, the Roberts article, about um, forming identification of first-generation students. Um, we're talking about class. I think um, class is a word that, that I really don't like. Um, I think with the world evolving and being as big as it is and America being as big as it is I think obviously years ago you were you were either you know you were either lower middle class upper class you know but now everybody has their own interpretations of class um, and I think you know if you're a first generation student does that mean that you're lower class does that mean that you're because you maybe don't come from an educated family that you aren't you know I think so this article discusses a bit of that um, it's not exclusively about first generation students, but um, the majority. So, as I said, you know, everyone now has their own interpretation of class, their own definition, their own, you know, categorizations. Yes. Um, but just a quick summary I don't want to talk too much about this article because we, um, one of the things it says in the article is that the purpose of it is to spark a debate, um, which it definitely will. Um, especially with a lot of us being first generation students um, so I believe we'll have a big debate about it in class I hope because I'm sure it would be a good one so I don't want to talk too much about it but just to summarise um, uh, the research was some quest took some questionnaires um, and asked first generation students what, how their experience was and, and how you know were they treated were they badly treated um, were they being were they undermined for being a first generation student or because of their class or or um anything like that um, I think it's it's clear from the article that people are being undermined on um, college get students are being undermined for being first 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 generation students, which is obviously having negative consequences on their their development um so a question to you guys would be if you're a first generation student has it affected or how has it affected? your um not just your your development but your just your overall learning experience. First question for you. Um so I think some of the answers were, were really interesting. It was good to get some real life examples um in in the article. Um especially like the one of the, the southern kid, a southern boy who who'd written uh an article on on uh, racial discrimination um, that he was proud of, and and he he received great feedback from his professor. Um, but when he showed it to his father, his father, who who hadn't gone to college, didn't have the same appreciation for it, didn't have the same sort of perspective. So that was just an example of how how being a first generation student affected that particular student. Moving on to the. The second article, which is the article that I spent the most time on, uh, took the most notes on, found the most interesting, um, the the Harley article on LGBT students with disabilities. I thought it was really interesting because it's it's um, LGBT students with disabilities isn't um, what I didn't feel was going to affect a lot of people on a college campus, but I was wrong. Um, and a quick math for you. Um, 11% of enrollment have disabilities on a college campus, an average college campus. And it says that one in six people on a college campus are identify, identify with LGBT. One of, or more than one of. Um, so, here's my math. If it's wrong, I'll take the heat. Um, if 11%, let's take a 10,000 enrollment as an average school. Um, if 11% of those is, is um, 1,100, if you were to take one of six, which is about 17.5% of them, 
that means that there are 193 people that are LGBT with disabilities, not one or the other. That's the that's the big thing you can take from this article. It's not you know we shouldn't treat a person with an LGBT person with disabilities as two different identities. You know we need to be prepared as student affairs professionals to help them as an LGBT person with a disability. You know, um, I gave a great example of a gay student who interpreted niceness as a sexual interest towards him. So he asked the person out on a date. The person declined. And, you know, if he needed counselling, should he have to go to a counsellor that's that's prepared to help him with being LGBT or having disabilities? Or does he have the right, which he, which he does, does he have the right to go to someone who's qualified to help him with, or knowledgeable, experience to help him with being LGBT with disabilities? You know, because it's, it's, it's a different fight. It's a different battle. Um... So that just emphasises how important it is for us to be knowledgeable and experienced. Not so much experienced because you can't force experience, you can't go find someone, but at least be knowledgeable and prepared to help someone that's LGBT with a disability rather than two separate identities. That's the biggest thing I took from this um, from this article. Um, so where was I? Yeah, so 193 people on a 10,000 person campus are going to be, according to the stats, LGBT with a disability. That's a lot higher than I'm sure any of us anticipated. Um, so my next question comes to you. Um, on the Crotio, Cro Croto and Lark study, um, believed that more than half of faculty and GAs felt that they would be um, knowledgeable enough to um, teach others about issues related to sexual orientation. So, would you, that's my next question, would you feel um, knowledgeable enough? Possibly after last week, I would, because I, I learned some new, new things last week, so would you feel qualified enough to help um, someone with issues related to sexual orientation? Because um, that's, a, you know, I don't believe that more than half of a, a faculty, not student affairs, just a faculty and GAs, um, felt that they were um, knowledgeable enough. So, would you? That's the next question. A little more about this article. Um, I did find it really interesting. Um, the another big point was that there's there's a lot of attention just now um, around the issues that that an LGBT person may experience or an LGBT person with disabilities may experience on a college campus, but there's very little research. Um, so there's not, there really isn't a lot of research, um, which might inspire someone in our class to do some research on our college campus, because if we're more than 10,000, the chances are we have more than 200 people that identify open, if they're, if they're out or not, I don't know, obviously. But it's an interesting, might be an interesting um, area to do some research in. Um, I'm going to fly through and just talk briefly about some of the models um, that we have discussed in the past that may um, not, maybe not directly relate, but definitely relate in some form. Um, definitely the Bronfenbrenner model um, that we all drew out our, our systems. Um, I wonder what a person with, a, an LGBT person with disabilities, what would their meal system look like with their friend circle and their student support system and, you know, their on-campus experiences? What would that look like for them? Uh, that's a, another question for you. How do you feel that it would differ? Um, especially if they're being... Um, if they're not being treated um, fairly or, or given the support that they need. Or, again, moving to the other article, the Roberts article, about first-generation students. Um, if they're being mistreated... Um, in terms of their social class or their, the fact that they're a first generation student, what would their meal systems look like? I'd, I'd thought about that. Um, there's definitely a, a constant theme of um, developing self and um, your group influences, which is big. Uh, your group could be the student support system, it could be your friends, it could be, uh, you know, are you, are you not being given the chance to, to meet new friends as an LGBT student with disabilities? Um, you know, so uh, that was definitely an LID, the leadership identification model about developing self and um, and 
um, your group influences, which again you could relate to the Brun from Brenner model and um, with the microsystems, and also the chickling, chickling <laughs> or even chickering, um, the ad- establishing identity. Um, would it be more difficult to establish identity as a, an LGBT person with disabilities? You know, if they're not out because um, they're experiencing so, experiencing so many problems um, on campus about how they're treated but, um, with their disabilities, would that make the whole um, establishing identity more difficult? I believe it would. Um, so, so many questions, so many possible debates. Um, I think the, 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 Roberts, the Roberts article is long enough that we can definitely um, take different things out of it. So I'm looking forward to hearing your opinions and I'm sure we'll have a healthy debate in class. Under 11 minutes isn't horrific, still a little bit long. Enjoy, I'm going to sleep because it's been a long day.